Welcome to Library Seminars, NOAA Central Library's educational platform for the presentation of research and ideas in support of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's mission. Today's seminar is part of the 2021 Knauss Fellows Lunch and Learn series, a monthly webinar where Knauss Fellows showcase their own research or projects they're supporting during their fellowship. Haley Olenek, a 2021 Knauss Fellow working in NOAA Fisheries National Stock Assessment Program in the Office of Science and Technology, will be our moderator and we'll introduce our two speakers, Holly Berger and Arya Janoff, each of whom will speak for 20 minutes followed by five minutes of questions and answers. But before I turn this webinar over to our speakers, here are a few logistical tips to help you enjoy our presentation. If you're having trouble with the audio or visual components of GoToWebinar, please log out and rejoin us. This usually will reset the software and resolve most technical issues. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel later today. I've put the link to the channel in the chat box. We highly encourage you to ask questions, which the speakers will address at the end of each of their presentations. So type their, your questions uh, throughout the seminar in the chat box, which is located in the GoToWebinar control panel. So with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Haley. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today to hear about some amazing research from a couple of my fellow Canals fellows. First up, we have Hallie Berger. For her fellowship, Hallie is serving as a Coastal Stressors Program Coordinator between the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program and NOAA National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science Competitive Research Program. She's working on building a research community to address the overlapping challenges of harmful algal blooms and ocean acidification. Hallie recently received her MS in Oceanography from the University of Connecticut, will show where she'll return after her fellowship year to finish her PhD and continue her research on the vulnerability of important shell fisheries to changing ocean conditions. I'll turn it over to Hallie now to tell us a little more about harmful algal blooms and ocean acidification. Great, thank you so much, Haley, for the introduction. Today, I'll be talking about my work as a fellow within NOAA on defining a research agenda for harmful algal blooms and ocean acidification. All right, so the two offices I work between the National Center for Coastal Ocean Science Competitive Research Program and the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program are working to better understand interactions between stressors, such as harmful algal blooms, which I will refer to as HABs, and coastal and ocean acidification, which I will refer to as OA. Um, I thought it'd be helpful if I started off giving some brief definitions for these terms. So harmful algal blooms or HABs are marine and freshwater phytoplankton that have proliferated to high concentrations, resulting in nuisance conditions or harmful impacts on marine and aquatic ecosystems, coastal communities, and human health, either through the production of toxic compounds or other biological, chemical, and physical impacts. Ocean acidification, or OA, is driven predominantly by ocean uptake of atmospheric carbon dioxide, or CO2, resulting in global scale changes in ocean chemistry with broad scale ecosystem impacts. Coastal acidification refers to a pH decline over decadal or longer timescales. And this results not only from atmospheric CO2 changes, but also from changes in coastal biogeochemical and hydrographic processes. Throughout this talk, I will use the term OA to represent both ocean and coastal acidification processes in marine and Great Lakes ecosystems in the United States. OA and HABs have some common drivers in coastal areas, such as eutrophication, and as a result, often co-occur in time and space. And we think this co-occurrence will become more common in the future under climate change conditions. There is also concern that OA may cause greater prevalence, spread, and toxicity of HABs through CO2 enrichment. So there's a growing need to understand OA and HAB interactions and their cascading impacts to coastal ecosystems, communities, and economies in order to inform the management of these resources. OA and HABs can impact the same coastal resources, such as aquaculture, wild fisheries, and tourism, but in different ways. And there may also be synergistic or antagonistic interactions that are not currently recognized by research efforts. So basically what I'm saying is that HAB and OA interactions are not well understood. Potential interactions could include physiological responses of HABs to OA, such as changes in growth rates, 
or changes in toxin production. Um, and there can also be changes in phytoplankton community composition as a result of ecosystem dynamics like competition and predation. And there is some evidence that halves may outcompete non have phytoplankton species in response to ocean acidification. Recent studies indicate that increased CO2 concentrations support higher phytoplankton densities and that carbonate chemistry, such as PCO2 and pH, has variable effects on growth rates and cellular toxin production across different HAD species and strains. And this is demonstrated in the table I'm showing here, which is based on a literature review by Melissa McCutcheon. Um, so you will see that across all studied halves, there are variable effects on growth rate and toxin production. And the same is seen even looking within one species. And here I'm showing Alexandrium as an example of that. Adding to this complexity, HAB and OA conditions also vary across U.S. regions. Starting with HABs, this map shows that HAB species and their associated human illnesses vary across regions, with paralytic shellfish poisoning and amnesic shellfish poisoning mostly occurring along the northeast coast as well as the west coast in Alaska. Neurotoxic shellfish poisoning occurs in the Gulf of Mexico and southeast, and there are cyano HABs in the Great Lakes. There is also regionality and interannual variability in carbonate system parameters. To give some background on carbonate chemistry, there are four major parameters, total alkalinity, dissolved inorganic carbon, PCO2, and pH. And measurements of at least two of those are needed in order to calculate the complete system, which also includes saturation states of calcium carbonate polymorphs, calcite and aragonite, which are relevant when considering impacts on shelf forming species like bivalves. PCO2 and pH are the two most commonly measured because they are the easiest. Um, and it's also helpful to think of ocean acidification itself as a multi-stressor because each of these parameters can have different impacts and it's helpful to look at them all together to get a full picture. However, most HAB studies to date looking at ocean, acidific ocean acidification impacts have only focused on one and usually it's PCO2 or pH. And if the others or at least one other aren't measured, it's difficult to know what's actually going on in the system. As far as regional patterns go for surface conditions of carbonate chemistry, shown here, the West Coast is an upwelling system, so deep water that has a signature of high PCO2 and low pH is brought to the surface along the West Coast. And the aragonite saturation state is also low along that coast compared to the other regions. On the East Coast, there's pretty uniform PCO2 and pH, but aragonite has a strong south to north decline, which is correlated with sea surface temperature. The plot also displays trends in different years, which are shown to the right and left of each coast. And this shows the interannual variability in many regions. Also not shown here is seasonal variability, which just adds to the complexity. And lastly, there's also regionality in monitoring and modeling capabilities across regions, which is something that will become more noticeable when I talk about the regional research challenges and priorities later in this talk. To address these research gaps, the National Center for Coastal Ocean Science Competitive Research Program and the Ocean Acidification Program held a virtual workshop last summer, August of 2020, to identify research needs at the intersection of HABs and ocean acidification. The workshop was designed to identify research needs and priorities to inform an upcoming federal funding opportunity by asking the following questions. How are OA and HAB dynamics linked? How does OA influence growth or toxicity of HABs? What are the food web impacts of OA and HABs in concert? Are some marine species more vulnerable or more resilient to the combined impacts of OA and HABs? What are the combined OA and HAB impacts to fisheries and coastal economies? And can we make projections about future conditions on relevant timescales for management of both OA and HABs? And then how could we encapsulate that information about combined impacts into, into something that would be useful for management and policymakers? And finally, what are the major gaps in our understanding? Preceding the workshop, Several experts in the field presented a series of webinars discussing the current understanding of OA HAB interactions in various regions. Webinar speakers were asked to share their thoughts about the greatest knowledge gaps and grand challenges related to OA HAB interactions. And then during the workshop, participants had the opportunity to work in groups to identify regional challenges, priorities, and relevant products to meet the needs identified 
for each region, which included the Great Lakes, the East Coast, the Gulf of Mexico, the West Coast, and Alaska. Um, the workshop started on the first day with an overview of acidification and HADS across the U.S. Um, and this featured lightning talks by some of the webinar speakers, followed by a panel discussion with all the participants. Um, day two featured a stakeholder panel to address their needs and perspectives, and also some regional breakout groups. And finally, day three was focused on research products, which featured lightning talks by some of the web webinar speakers, as well as regional breakouts again. So now I will walk us through the outcomes of the workshop that were common across all regions, and then followed up by the regional highlights for each day of the workshop, starting with the first day. And on each of um, these overview slides, you'll see word clouds that are created from the chat and questions on that day of the workshop, so you can get an idea of what topics came up the most. So starting with the common grand challenges, these included the need to recognize that OA itself is a multi-stressor involving a host of different chemical species, such as PCO2, pH, and saturation state, each of which may interact or have different impacts. And in order to understand these different impacts, there is a need for factorial experimental designs that decouple the carbonate system parameters and identify individual effects and mechanisms. OA also occurs along with other environmental stressors, such as eutrophication and hypoxia, which each have their own impacts on HADS as well. There's also basic information needed for OA impacts on HADS at many ecological levels, ranging from life stage to species to population to ecosystem. And there's a need to expand studies to include important resource species, such as shellfish, as well as coastal economies and social systems. Finally, a major point that came out of the workshop was the need for co-monitoring of OA and HAB parameters in order to discern relationships and start building understanding. Now I'll walk through some of the regional highlights from the first day of the workshop in terms of grand challenges. Starting with the Great Lakes. Monitoring data in this region suggests that current variability in pH can be as much as 0.05 units change per day, but current biogeochemical and carbonate chemistry monitoring is severely insufficient. And examination of isolated HAB strains specific to the Great Lakes are also needed, as well as natural communities to understand how species interact in situ. For the East Coast, looking at the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic Bight, there are eutrophic estuaries that are particularly vulnerable to OA during warmer months due to accelerated rates of respiration and low buffering capacity compared to other regions. However, in the Southeast US, there's intense buffering, oversaturation of calcium carbonate minerals in warmer temperatures, which make acidification less likely in this region, particularly within the surface waters. The Gulf of Mexico, there's eutrophication enhanced OA in the coastal and estuarine systems. But there's also a severe lack of robust OA and HAB observational data outside of certain locations in seasons or years. The West Coast OA is most strongly associated with upwelling events that may also influence HABs. Finally, in Alaska, there are a number of remote communities with high dependence on marine resources. There's also a large variability in the coastal ecosystem due to glacial melt and changes in sea ice coverage. However, there are relatively limited observations in coastal model modeling of environmental conditions compared to these other regions. On day two, research priorities were discussed. Some that emerged as key priorities across regions included incorporating stakeholder input into monitoring programs and leveraging assets in order to measure both OA and HAB parameters simultaneously, evaluating the attribution of HAB events in toxicity to ocean acidification including the different carbonate system parameters versus other stressors such as temperature, investigation of OA impacts to HABs via lab, mesocosm, and field experiments, and finally, understanding the multi-stressor impacts and interactions to multiple species and life stages along with community and food web interactions. Now onto the regional highlights for these research priorities. In the Great Lakes, there's a need to advance the understanding of interactions within the food web especially the role of zebra mussels, which has not yet been examined, as well as investigating the effects of overwintering and pH on bloom initiation 
and the role of tributaries as a source of local variation in carbon, nutrients, and halves. On the East Coast, there's a need to tease out the relative importance of local and climate-driven stressors and the biological feedbacks among them, including temperature, nutrients, storms, land use, hypoxia. And some questions we have on this coast are what should be monitored to improve models? What are the thresholds of concern? And these may also differ by location. In the Gulf of Mexico, there's a need to increase monitoring for both OA and HABs. And this can be done through citizen science and stakeholder engagement to increase the knowledge and monitoring of these issues. There's also a need to understand the linkages and connectivity of the estuaries to the coast and open ocean to understand drivers of both OA and HABs. For the West Coast, there's already a plethora of data and model output that really needs to be mined and analyzed together. Uh, models can also be parameterized with coordinated experiments in the lab and using natural communities. And finally, there's a need to couple and downscale ocean estuary systems to understand the exchange of HADs in OA and food web impacts in enclosed areas. Finally, for Alaska, there's a need to collect continuous high temporal resolution measurements to understand relationships between temperature, salinity, carbonate chemistry, and HABs, and also observe and or model temperature, salinity, and CO2 parameters at depth, which is where many important fisheries are located, such as crab and groundfish. And finally, leveraging community monitoring in order to build information on these relationships over time across a larger spatial scale. And finally, the last day was focused on research products those that will address cross-regional needs should incorporate modeling at multiple spatial and temporal scales for prediction, attribution of both direct and indirect effects and sensitivity testing, leveraging monitoring assets to add OA and HAB parameters measured together with other ecosystem stressors such as temperature and oxygen, as well as data product development, while making data available in near real time for integration and synthesis. And lastly, continued and enhanced communication and outreach efforts, both as a delivery mechanism for research results and to identify stakeholder needs. And finally, here are the regional highlights for these research products. Starting again with the Great Lakes, um, the participants identified the need for dashboards with real-time data that display different levels of information that target the different stakeholder groups, including thresholds and warnings as well as predictive models and outputs tailored specifically to those stakeholder groups with information on HABs, OA, and their interactions on seasonal and daily timescales. And finally, scenario models to predict how HABs will change in response to future expected changes in OA and eutrophication. On the East Coast, there is identified a need for maps of HAB and OA hotspots that are superimposed with shellfish areas as well as advanced warnings of HAB events using model simulations and advice to monitoring programs where, when, and what they should monitor to understand combined effects of HABs in OA. For the Gulf of Mexico, there's a need for a Gulf-wide spatial vulnerability assessment for both stressors, as well as maps of existing monitoring accompanied by easy data access for stakeholders. On the West Coast, there's a need to interpret the data and model output already in existence in order to make it useful for managers. And this could include information on biological impacts, source attribution of HAB and OA events, and an integrated metric of duration and severity of these OA HAB events. Last but not least, in Alaska, there was a need for a statewide HAB and OA monitoring and response plan that would address the current regional needs. An integrated data portal could be used to share data in both real time and also to help develop a forecast and risk assessment product going forward, as well as an outreach document which could summarize monitoring and analytical techniques for general OA HAP audiences to get that monitoring going. In summary, the overarching need that emerged across the workshop is that future research should include a holistic approach to multi-stressor ecosystem research. And with sufficient understanding, predictions, vulnerability assessments, and other products can be produced to communicate impact and risks. It will be important to understand how changes in carbonate chemistry affect both halves that produce toxins harmful to humans, as well as halves that harm fish and shellfish themselves 
and therefore affect the industries reliant on those species. Importantly, the workshop identified a need for increased collaboration between HAB and OA scientists. Interdisciplinary approaches will be required to disentangle the complexities of HAB OA interactions and address stakeholder needs. So now I'll talk about the next steps for my fellowship and beyond. Um, starting with the workshop proceedings, which will be wrapped up into an OAP technical memorandum, um, which we are finalizing now. So please check it out when it comes out to get uh, more information on the regional breakdowns of challenges, priorities, and research products. We are also working with a team of experts to write a literature review um, on HABs and OA in the US. This will give an introduction to OA for HAB scientists and vice versa in order to facilitate those collaborations by giving them the state of knowledge as well as the research gaps that are needed to address management needs in each region. And finally, and really exciting is that we're working on putting out a federal funding opportunity soon, um, which will hopefully fund research on integrated impacts of OA and HABs and some of those interactions we talked about with projects starting in 2022. And I also wanted to give a plug for our OA HAB team on the Ocean Acidification Information Exchange. Um, this website is a forum for all things ocean acidification. And if you're interested in joining, you can go to the website, oainfoexchange.org, and request an account. You'll then receive an email with your login credentials. And the first time you'll log in, you'll see this big yellow sticky note on the top, which gives you some helpful information about getting started, including how to join teams. And from there, you can hopefully find our OA HAB team and request to join it. Um, and we really hope that this forum will be used um, for you all to learn more about how OA influence HABs and vice versa, share your ideas about OA HAB interactions and the factors contributing to them, um, consider the best ways to co-monitor these parameters, and so on, and hopefully start some great collaborations. Lastly, I'd just like to thank everyone who made this workshop possible, including all of the webinar speakers and panelists who I've listed here. And thank you all for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Hallie. Um, that was really interesting. Audience, we have about seven minutes for questions. So uh, please go ahead and type them in the questions chat box, and I will read them to Hallie. Um, I'm glad you're getting some water. Let me open the, the question box here. And uh, we're going to wait for a second. There's a little bit of a wait. Um, I also want to encourage everyone to download um, Hallie's slides, which are located under the handouts drop down menu in the control panel. There's lots of good information in there. Um, and she has uh, offered them so that you can take a look on your own time. So just a few minutes. So it's a little strange, Hallie, with the <laughs> with the quietness, but um, one other thing I want to just uh, make sure people know is that uh, we are recording this presentation. And if you know somebody that might be interested in um, Hallie's presentation, I encourage you to go to our YouTube channel, which I uh, put into the chat box um, later this afternoon and uh, forward or share this presentation with anyone who you think might be interested. Excellent. Well, we're just going to give this another second. Oh, uh, we get a compliment. You guys, this is great job, Hallie, from a friend. You're welcome. All right. So let's give it another second. And uh, if there are no questions, please feel free if you think of something to send it, because I will forward any questions to our speakers today. Um, but if there are no questions, I'm going to go ahead and transfer the screen. Oh, actually, here's one. Oh, they're coming in now. So this first question, Hallie, asks, it says, you mentioned several scientific advancement needs. What do you think would be the most important advancement to add from an applied management perspective? Yeah, from an applied management perspective, I think there's really a need um, in some of these regions that already have a lot more information to kind of encapsulate that in a way that would be useful and accessible. Um, so making some of those data products I talked about, um, such as real-time data dashboards, 
um, or some sort of product that would show, you know, a warning of a have or an OA event, I think that would be most useful for the managers to actually be able to go in there and find whatever information they need. And for those products, it's really important to make them with the stakeholders themselves at the table um, because they know what will be most useful for them. So it's beneficial to work with them from the start. Excellent. We've got a couple more questions. Um, this next person asks, do you have any comments on Habs and Brown Tide in the Northeast? Um, I will say I do not have a background in Habs, so I have heard some talks about Brown Tides in the Northeast, but I'm not exactly sure if there's a tie to OA there. Um, that research really still needs to be done. And yeah, I'm not a Hab ex expert at, by no means. Um, most of my research has been on OA and other climate stressors. Great. Um, this next uh, question is actually a compliment as well as a question. Hello, great talk, Hallie. Thanks. When and how will the workshop proceedings and lit review be available? Yes, so for the workshop proceedings, we are working with the NOAA library right now to make sure it's compliant and accessible. Um, but we have a final draft in hand, so as soon as that is done, it will be um, available through NOAA as a technical memorandum. And then the literature review, we're really just in the very beginning of the writing stage, so I don't have too much information on that yet. Wonderful, and thank you for working with NOAA Central Library IRF on that. Uh, another question says, uh, do you know of any projects already planned to monitor OA in subsurface Alaskan waters? Um, I do not know of any projects specifically. I know that that was called out um, specifically in Alaska because of those benthic resources like the crab and ground fish fisheries. Um, but I'm not exactly sure if anyone has started looking at that. But hopefully, if there are people out there who want to look at that, they will submit a proposal to our funding opportunity and get some of that research done. Excellent. Uh, another question, oh, and again, a compliment. Wonderful presentation. Do you have a sense of what we can apply from any international work on these two stressors? or what international researchers have discussed on the OA info exchange? Yeah, so there, um, if you go to the um, OA info exchange, there is an international audience as well. It's not just folks in the US. Um, I don't think many international folks have joined the OA have team yet, but I really would encourage that um, because we want to think about applications beyond just the US, although that is the focus of um, some of these products that I'm talking about with the workshop report and the literature review and so on. Um, but these problems really are global and it's important to take that perspective when thinking about solutions. Excellent. I think that might be the last question. Uh, I appreciate everyone's questions and, and your answers as well, Hallie. Um, I'm going to transfer the screen to our second speaker now and Haley will introduce him. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks for sharing your work, Hallie. Really interesting and super important. Up next, we have Dr. Arye Janoff. Arye is a Canals Fellow with the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, Subcommittee on Coast Guard and Maritime Transportation. That's a mouthful. Um, he recently com completed his PhD in Environmental Science and Management at Montclair State University where he's focused on coupling between geomorphology and economics to understand drivers of urban coastal evolution. Beyond his research, REA serves as secretary of the Bradley Beach Environmental Commission, managing editor of the Canals Connector newsletter, and he's an avid surfer and cyclist, passionate about ocean access and investment to bicycle transportation infrastructure. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, REA. Great, thanks so much, Haley. And uh, let me know that you can see my screen here. Just checking. Looks great. Cool, thank you. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Haley mentioned, my name is Arya Janoff and I'm a Canals Marine Policy Fellow in the US House of Reps with the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, Subcommittee on Coast Guard and Maritime Transportation. Indeed, it is a mouthful. 
Thank you to the NOAA community for the opportunity to discuss my work with you all today. I recently completed my PhD at Montclair State University, uh, working with Jorge Lorenzo Trueba. And today I'll discuss a chapter in my dissertation on community scale beach nourishment decisions along human modified coasts, in which I explored the interplay between socioeconomics, coordination, and shoreline change. This work was done in collaboration with researchers at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and thanks to the NSF for funding this project under the Dynamics of Coupled Natural Human Systems Program, and for the computational resource support under the Major Research Instrumentation Program. Okay, so let's dive in. First, for some motivation. My, over, my overarching questions in this research were, why are we intervening in the coastal zone? How do we make these decisions on how and when we intervene and how much? And what are the consequences of the decisions that we make? So what do I mean by interventions? Well, we dredge sediments from offshore or tidal inlet reservoirs to add to our beaches. We place hard structures in the surf zone to alter the beaches dynamics to our liking. We build hard revetments and more recently, dunes to protect against damaging storm surges. And we modify the subaerial or above water beach to enhance its tourism capacity in the summer months and to reduce the accumulation of windblown sand on roadways in the winter months. So why do we care about how developed coasts behave on multi-decadal timescales? Well, there's a lot of money at stake and not just in the form of large beachfront homes. There are municipal, county and state roads sewers, water mains, electricity lines, and telecommunication systems. And beaches provide other valuable services as well, such as boardwalk festivals and concessions, recreational facilities, such as bocce courts, playgrounds, mini golf, and many more, outdoor venues for community building and private events, such as concerts, farm markets, and weddings, towel space to support sunbathing, swimming, surfing, fishing, sailing, and many other ocean-going activities, ecotourism centered on barrier island, marsh, dune, and intertidal habitats, and something spiritual by nature that grounds our soul into the sand and sea, solidifying our presence for generations to come. So what happens when our coastal life and infrastructure are threatened by chronic erosion, storms, or sea level rise? Well, we've abandoned our homes when the damage has been too great. We've raised our homes to avoid flood damage. We've hardened our coast to hold our position, and in recent years, we've actually widened our beaches, as you can see here. And this anthropogenic signal is evident in shoreline morphologies. Previous research from Hapke et al. on the left found a switch from historically erosive beaches in bold to more recently progradational beaches in italics, as evidenced by the mean rate switch on the right bar graph from Armstrong et al. And Armstrong et al. find that this switch correlates with a rapid uptick in beach nourishments starting in approximately the 1960s. And zooming into Monmouth County, New Jersey, the geomorphic consequence of this signal is clear, spanning multiple communities along the coast. In this case, from 1920 to 2002, Avon-by-the-Sea and Bradley Beach have experienced a seaward shift in their shorelines highlighted by the red lines relative to their oceanfront infrastructure highlighted by the blue lines. So how do these inter-community dynamics control systemic behavior? Well, Lazarus et al. and others observe that communities have failed to coordinate in the past, but Gopalakrishnan et al. indicate that coordinated beach nourishments result in higher nourishment rates and thus wider beaches by eliminating the free rider incentive, representing the economically optimal outcome. So can these behavioral feedbacks based on management scheme explain the beach widening that we see here in New Jersey and along much of the U.S. East Coast? This question is especially topical given communities may maintain decentralized policies in the future, as suggested by Gopal Krishnan et al., which would amplify wealth disparity due to sea level rise induced erosion. So I explored some of these questions using an idealized modeling framework. And in this framework, there are three alongshore cells in the model domain, two neighboring communities, I equals one and I equals two, and one boundary cell, I equals three, that proxies adjacent natural coast. In response to background erosion, the communities can nourish their beaches, forming an ephemeral seaward, seaward protrusion and triggering a longshore tra sediment transport based on the coastline's gradient, denoted by the solid line connecting the white circles relative to the angle of wave approach in the top left of the plan view. The sediment is taken from the upper shore face or subaerial beach in seaward cells and deposited at the shoreline in landward cells with a periodic condition at the system's boundary such that any sediments leaving one edge, QL3, are received at the other, 
And then cross-shore nourishment steepen the shore phase slope beyond its equilibrium profile, denoted by the pink line, triggering sediment transport from the upper shore face offshore to the lower shore face or shore face toe, thus relaxing the slope toward equilibrium. The system's morphodynamics can thus be described by two moving boundaries, the shoreline XS and the shore face toe XT. The shoreline's location relative to the property setback forms the beach width, which is capitalized into the beachfront property as an environmental amenity, adding both protective and recreational value. Combined with the corresponding project costs, I performed cost benefit, cost benefit analyses for a range of return periods between renourishments or rotation lengths. And given a fi fixed project volume, I found the optimal strategy that yields a maximum net benefit. I then compared how communities optimize their rotation lengths based on their respective welfare analyses or the non-coordination scheme, or based on their joint net benefit, the coordination scheme. Next, I explored the role of longshore wealth disparities on strategy selections and both the geomorphic and economic outcomes of these management decisions. And finally, I tested how this system might respond under higher erosion rates associated with sea level rise and higher sand costs associated with reduced resource availability in the future as expected. In general, the model produces four behaviors on the left. Seaward growth due to a short rotation length seen in panel A, hold the line due to a moderate rotation length in panel B, slow retreat due to a long rotation length that results in beachfront property loss, panel C, and full retreat due to no nourishment, also resulting in property loss seen in panel D. And I see evidence of these mode behaviors in the field based on nourishment records on the right, where communities such as Ocean City, New Jersey nourish a lot and widen their beaches in panel A on the top left. Brigantine, New Jersey nourishes just enough to protect their properties, seen in panel B. And Dauphin Island, Alabama and Cedar Island, Virginia, panels C and D respectively, nourish infrequently or not at all, resulting in property abandonment or relocation. So from community scale nourishment and socioeconomic data in New Jersey, I also found that a community's rotation length decreases or its nourishment frequency increases as its beachfront wealth increases. Variability in this relationship, however, could be explained in part by the wealth and nourishment choices in neighboring communities as well. For instance, let's take a look at two pairs of neighboring communities in Southern New Jersey. So first I highlight Avalon and Stone Harbor, and second I highlight Strathmere and Sea Isle City. And zooming in, we see that Avalon and Stone Harbor are spaced farther apart than Strathmere and Sea Isle City, as evidenced by their scale bars on the bottom right corner in the imagery. This longshore effect manifests in their beach widths, where Avalon and Stone Harbor's morphodynamics are more decoupled on the bottom left, meaning they're more dissimilar, and Strathmere and Sea Isle City experience more interconnected beach morphodynamics on the bottom right, or their shoreline morphologies are more similar. This highlights the importance of a longshore connectivity in nourishment policy development. Testing the effect of wealth distribution between neighbors, as I had mentioned earlier, with one community's property value on the y-axis and the others on the x-axis, I found a behavioral progression from full retreat to slow retreat to hold the line to seaward growth as wealth increases, with the thresholds between behaviors depending on the combination of property values under coordination in the panel on the left, and on each community's individual property value under non-coordination in the panel on the right. But I was also interested in the economic implications of such management policies. Comparing the net benefit of coordination and non-coordination quantifies the marginal importance of working cooperatively, depending on a two community couplets location within the regime space. So aside from the scenario in which coordination avoids property abandonment, highlighted by the arrows on the left, wealth disparate systems realize the greatest marginal increase in net benefit by coordinating. I pinpoint a representative two community couplet here to show the key difference. In the uncoordinated scheme, wealthier communities tend to undernourish or nourish less frequently than they would have under coordination because they ignore the external benefits associated with helping preserve their neighbors' beaches. Whereas less wealthy communities tend to overnourish or nourish more frequently than they would have under coordination because they do not account for the beneficial effects of their neighbors' nourishment activities. In short, Working together, wealthier communities should nourish more and less wealthy communities should nourish less than if they form their policies alone. And I see evidence of this dynamic in the field with many instances of less wealthy communities nourishing more than their wealthier neighbors as seen in the left panel 
showing the nourishment flux difference relative to the less wealthy community as a function of the wealth disparity for each data point representing a two community couplet. Where data below zero, highlighted by this red box, indicate the less wealthy community has a higher nourishment flux than the wealthier community. This results in wider beaches regardless of the magnitude of wealth disparity, as we see in the right, showing the beach width difference relative to the less wealthy community as a function of the wealth difference. Where data below zero, highlighted again by this red box, indicate the less wealthy community realizes wider beaches than the wealthier community. While this data provides evidence of overnourishment, there are some dynamics outside the scope of the model. I explore other possible determinants of nourishment activity in future work. But what happens in the future as these systems face climate threats such as sea level rise? In addition, as communities deplete their nearshore sand supplies and much, must search for beach quality sand further offshore, the cost of sand is expected to increase. How will systems respond to these physical and economic changes? I explored community responses and geomorphic behaviors associated with increased erosion rates on the y-axis and increased sand costs on the x-axis in the regime diagrams for coordination and non-coordination schemes in panels A and B respectively. If communities coordinate, they might be able to nourish more and preserve their properties longer under higher erosion rates and sand costs than if they manage their beaches alone. This is clearer in the cross-section through the regime spaces on the right in panel C. This result provides evidence that continued decentralized management will be detrimental for property preservation and that the current misallocation of nourishment effort could be unsustainable. More broadly, the model presents a potential complement to property buyout programs, whereby nourishment can reduce the rate of retreat, but still lead to the managed removal of properties from the most vulnerable areas. Ultimately, regional coordination is required to ensure that our management policies are both economically and socially just. So what questions emerged? First, why are less wealthy communities nourishing more than wealthier communities in the model, which goes beyond the, the scope of the model and results in an appreciable geomorphic difference between the two communities? Can this be explained by non-coordination alone or is there something else within the system controlling this outcome? In addition, how are the hard structures that I mentioned before, such as groins and jetties, affecting these nourishment decisions? Do we see dampened nourishment efforts updrift of these structures due to impoundment and amplified efforts downdrift due to sediment starvation? So as stated, many communities rely on summer tourism for sustaining their local economies, as evidenced here in Long Branch, New Jersey, on a warm summer day. At the multi-community scale, we see a difference in beach recreation by community. Where fewer tourists visit wealthier communities such as Seaside Park, and more tourists visit less wealthy communities such as Seaside Heights. Often, these less wealthy communities have boardwalk attractions that, when threatened, require rebuilding and protecting. And wealthier communities like Deal have sought to restrict beach access and have chosen to nourish less, resulting in narrower beaches as seen at the bottom of this image. So this is evidence of the NIMBY effect, where those with adequate financial and political capital value and thus seek a more private beach experience. We can see evidence of this categorical difference in recreational preference at various points along the New Jersey coast. On the left, Deal, the wealthier, more residential community, nourishes less than Asbury Park, the less wealthy tourism-centric community. And on the right, wealthier Lavalette nourishes less than the less wealthy tourism-centric Seaside Heights. In both cases, these nourishment decisions have resulted in wider beaches for less wealthy communities. This dynamic could help explain the behavioral and geomorphic trends that we had observed in the field. So what's the key takeaway from this work and what does this mean for coastal policy? Communities might forego significant benefits by failing to coordinate their management plans. Decentralized schemes might make beachfront property protection more difficult under rapid sea level rise and increasing resource costs. Particularly vulnerable are less wealthy communities who are overnourishing at present, possibly representing an environmental injustice. And in follow-up work that extended this model framework, I found that property value is not the only driver of community scale nourishment decisions, but that local beach tourism is also important, especially in New Jersey. Sorry, I'm gonna click behind. And that population density has been a key driver of community responses to groin-induced erosion. So in future policymaking, we must include social equity as well. This means reframing how we define benefits, given that a wealth-centered analysis will invariably disadvantage low-wealth communities 
making their project justifications more difficult if the benefit cost ratio is too low. As a start, President Biden signed an executive order shortly after his inauguration that included a Justice 40 initiative to deliver 40% of climate investment benefits to disadvantaged communities. Such directives are key, especially in concert with state level policy changes. Concurrently, legislators could introduce language that adds priority within existing grant programs to fund projects with environmental justice considerations to expand how agencies define project benefits or to stand up new programs with similar goals. So to close, I'd like to extend my heartfelt thanks to the NOAA community and everyone beyond for attending my talk today. As a Knauss Fellow, I have felt welcomed, supported, and inspired to use my science for better policymaking. It is an honor to have this platform to speak on such issues as science policy and environmental equity. And with that, I'll open the floor to any questions that you might have and leave you with one of the, my favorite photos that I've taken of my hometown, Bradley Beach, New Jersey, and leave you with my email and Twitter in the event that you have any uh, follow-up questions. Thanks so much. Wonderful, thank you. We do have some questions, um, but before I launch into them, I just want to remind everyone that we want to hear from you. So please, uh, please type your questions in the control panel which on the right side. And uh, we have about, uh, let's see, we've got about 13 minutes uh, for questions. So let's go and start. So this first question says, nourishment projects may be paid for by a community slash county or by the federal government, for example, USACE. This clearly affects the frequency of nourishment and coordination among communities. How did you account for the source of funding? Yeah, it's a great question because um, obviously the way that we nourish our beaches has changed a lot over the last 50 to even 50 years to even a century. Um, so this modeling framework, um, there's a very uh, minor component to it that can be tweaked in order to account for federal and state involvement. Um, where basically we would just take a percentage of the project costs away and attribute that to um, you know external sources of funding but then in addition obviously the army corps in the last 20 or so years has been um, designing these projects kind of forcing coordination uh, amongst communities designing regional projects um, but they don't necessarily look at uh, uh, the analysis on the community scale um, in this way um, and the project benefits again are kind of defined by uh, reduced damage costs. Um, so essentially how this would play into the model is that the cost would be lower and um, the community would maybe be able to justify a higher nourishment frequency. Um, but the general dynamic could still be the same because communities do have, um, you know, they are on the hook at least for a lot of the initial nourishments uh, where they have, there's a cost sharing agreement, of course. Um, so really, the purpose of this modeling framework was to abstract ourselves from federal and state involvement and try to understand from a game theoretic perspective how communities might interact, especially if the funding sources are reduced in the future and communities are left on the hook to fund these projects on their own. You know, how are they going to coordinate? What are going to be some of the socioeconomic implications? Excellent. Thank you. Um, there's a compliment here that says an interesting study with interesting results. Thank you. Um, and the next Thank question you. asks, uh, how does vegetation affect the beach nourishment process? Yeah, uh, it's a great question because I'm showing here a picture of um, a, an artificial dune, which was designed on top of a beach nourishment project. Um, so the vegetation, if you have a dune, um, such as you see here, uh, basically it would be able to hold the sand for longer potentially. Um, there are obviously going to be some areas where uh, the dune is unable to uh, take root um, because maybe it's a highly erosive area and there's not enough time for the for the dune grasses to grow uh, and actually be able to hold the sand in place. But the idea is then, um, you know, not only would it hold that sand in place and store more of the sand in the subaerial portion of the beach rather than offshore in like a sandbar or transported alongshore out of the system, um, but when there are storm events that take away some of the beach in front of the dune, then the dune would be able to resupply the beach uh, with sand. And the Army Corps, when they design a lot of the artif artificial dune projects, they actually account for this. And they say that a certain percentage of the dune is expected to erode away uh, to resupply the beach. And then the dune itself, because there's an eco-geomorphic feedback here, 
would be able to recolonize the Fordune environment and build itself back up when sand is transported back via wind uh, onto the dune. Um, so that then you bring into the equation this whole um, you know, complex interconnected system, eco-geomorphic feedbacks, and then socioeconomic feedbacks. Um, and actually somebody else in my research group is looking primarily at dunes. And I was looking um, you know, more at the um, broader scale, just looking at nourishment projects. Um, so that's some insight into how the system would behave, but in terms of how it would change coordination versus non-coordination, um, again, it might just change the frequency, but if if both communities have these dunes, then probably the inter-community dynamics would be the same. But then it brings an interesting question, what if one community can afford dunes and another can't on top of their beach nourishment projects? Um, you know, what if they, one community is a seawall, the other doesn't? What if one community has a groin, the other doesn't? And depending on where the groin is placed, that would also affect how the communities nourish, like I had mentioned, and that was in uh, a future dissertation chapter that I explored that question. Um, so these are some really interesting feedbacks that need to be explored uh, to build off of this research. So it was a great question. It was, thank you. Um, this next question asks, did you look at the different sources of sand and if how they differed oops, um, from wealthier communities? Uh, the different sources of sand, like between communities, I guess, is the question. I, I, um, I think so. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. yeah. If so, how how did they differ um, from wealthier communities? Right. Um, well, typically, I, I can speak to the New Jersey environment. It's a little bit more challenging if we start talking about like the West Coast, because I know that uh, nourishment is becoming an interesting management solution there. But sand resources are a lot more limited, especially on the community scale. Um, but at least in the New Jersey environment, um, sand resources that are offshore are typically available. It's the same resource that's available to multiple communities, especially, um, you know, I, I had shown uh, a time lapse earlier. Um, and I don't know if you saw the scale bar, but that was, that was on the order of, you know, a few kilometers. Um, so a lot of these communities are in New Jersey are quite small. So generally, they, they're able to draw from the sand, the same sand resource. But then that brings, um, you know, interesting questions about common pool resource issues, um, tragedy of the commons, and over exploitation of resources. So there has been um, some other researcher, researchers who have looked at beach nourishment dynamics as a result of a limited supply of sand. In my model, we were really just looking at um, treating this as an external parameter uh, and being able to just vary the cost like I had shown in the future projections um, for the system as a whole. Um, but it would be an interesting exercise to look at two communities that are competing for the same re sand resource. And then based on how they compete, if the wealthy community is depleting that sand resource and then driving up the cost, that would probably only amplify the results that we saw of less wealthy communities maybe not being able to keep pace, not being able to afford nourishment projects, and then being forced to retreat. And then just highlight that environmental injustice and that wealth uh, you know, asymmetry that results in the system. Wonderful, thank you. Um, there's two more questions here. One asks, if communities want to improve their coordination, how would you suggest they optimize the regional boundary? Um, yeah, <laughs> this is it's a tough question because um, actually for my dissertation, uh, I invited, uh, as Haley mentioned at the top, I am the secretary of the Bradley Beach Environmental Commission. Um, and I am also fairly engaged at the local level with my, uh, you know, council members and mayor. And I invited them to my dissertation. Uh, and one of the council members, we had a follow-up discussion, like a two-hour discussion. And he's like, you know, I, I learned a lot. I learned that we need to coordinate. So how do we do it? I was like, oh man, that's a tough question because it's hard enough to like coordinate, you know, a schedule, <laughs> like just with yourself. Um, so it's difficult to then try to say, you know, th there's a cost of coordination. You know, it, it takes time, it takes effort, it takes continued collaboration, continued communication. In terms of how to optimize the regional boundary, I guess the way that I'm interpreting this question is how broad should we coordinate, right? Should we coordinate just between two communities or should, should we coordinate between 10, 20, 40, like the entire stretch of coast? Um, I think that we need to look at uh, literal cells. Like we need to look at um, how sand is managed at the regional scale where 
again, going back to one of the other questions, where's the sand resource? Because it would be difficult to coordinate a community like you know, Cape May, New Jersey with Asbury Park, New Jersey, that um, if anyone's familiar with the New Jersey coast, those are on two separate ends of the coast, like could be like 100 miles away. So you can't really coordinate at that scale, maybe. Um, but as a start, I would say having state um, agencies um, that are able to provide high level policy frameworks like a California Coastal Commission or an Ocean Protection Council. Um, you know, there are other states that of course I'm going to leave out, um, but they have those, you know, like the, the Louisiana has their state, you know, coastal master plan. And I know that this is something that New Jersey is working on and many other states are working on. Uh, coordination across the whole state requires looking at the, the problem as like a public good. Um, and rather than looking at it as just like property protection. So this is also about enhancing beach access for the whole state, not just the coastal communities, the people who are traveling from two hours away to go to the beach. You know, I'm going to the Eastern shore to surf in a couple of days and, you know, uh, I'm gonna be spending money at the Eastern shore. So therefore they have to try to make decisions for people who are coming from DC as well, right? So it's, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not giving a definitive answer here, uh, but it's, it's a really challenging question. And it's something that we as scientists are trying to figure out. And then the policymakers, you know, are trying to figure out as well. This is very much a, a budding field trying to understand how humans in the first place interact with the natural environment and then on top of that how do we actually find you know optimal policy solutions is uh quite challenging but i think that it takes um state level planning excellent that's a hard question uh there's two more questions uh we have a few more minutes um when this one asks or says i enjoyed the talk Ari. There is a growing number of projects suggesting that decisions on the timing and location of beach nourishment should be made with a local understanding of how natural processes move sand. I like the thought that if coordinated, we could be better protected. Do you have any thoughts on whether this breaks down under certain higher sea level rise scenarios? I think you may have just alluded to some of them. Yeah, um, uh, definitely. You know, there's, there's, um, at least within this framework, right? Uh, because this framework is looking at benefits at the property scale. Um, so, and like I said in the um, the policy recommendations, that we need to kind of reframe benefits. Um, and like I had mentioned, you know, as a a tourist going to the coast, like we need to account for those things in in our benefits. Um, but that all that to say that within this framework, if we force the model with really high erosion rates, which is a proxy for High sea level rise rates, uh, then there are no communities, you know, at certain points that would be able to keep pace, and they would have to retreat. Um, and then that brings into the equation not just uh, beach nourishment as a protection or management strategy, but then also potentially buyout programs, and then also flood insurance, um, you know, and and how we incentivize people to actually move away from the coast. Um, so under those really rapid sea level rise rates, it as the model stands today, um, with all of the caveats that I had mentioned, even still, um, communities won't be able to justify nourishment projects, um, even the wealthiest of communities. But then if you add into that, you know, equitable buyout programs um, and incentives, you know, free market incentives, especially within the flood insurance markets, then you can get scenarios where communities might actually start retreating sooner and then not, you know, overdeveloping along the coast, not continuing to nourish their beaches or continuing to deplete sand resources. Excellent. I, I have to add, end with one, one last question and then um, it's a West Coast question, which I think is very nice. Here on the West Coast, our sand resources are limited and becoming more, more so, which is driving up the costs. How does yeah. your framework consider limited nourishment material, especially for coordinating among jurisdictions? Yeah, so as I had mentioned earlier, um, it's really just an external cost parameter. So I just have um, the cost of sand uh, per cubic meter that I can vary, which is what I did when I was looking at the future projections. But again, um, and I've actually played around with this in the modeling framework, um, but it's not included here um, in this current version of the model, um, looking at a depleting sand resource and, and trying to build in those inter-community dynamics when you are competing for the same sand resource, especially like I had mentioned on, in a place on the West Coast or like the West Coast where communities, you know, they're 
um, jurisdiction might be larger and then you know just they might cover a larger land area like i'm thinking of like an oceanside california is obviously much larger than a, a, a you know half a mile long ocean grove new jersey um, that's getting into specifics but uh, the point is that that can be built into the model um, like i had mentioned other researchers also have looked at this um, and basically you just have this uh, this other uh, module within the model that accounts for the volume of sand that's available and then it's just a mass balance and you take each community and you say you know they're pumping sand every three years and they're pumping 10 whatever unit right or you know 100,000 meters cubed then you take that out of the resource and then you have a, fun a cost function that accounts for how the cost changes based on how much is available to the two communities and in that way you can get this feedback between the communities so then maybe there's an incentive for that community that's nourishing a lot at the beginning um, to not you know out compete their neighbor especially if they want to coordinate and protect the whole coastline um, and yeah i had another point and it seemed to have slipped my mind so maybe it'll come back to me <laughs> that's okay it's actually time to conclude our presentation so yeah. uh hallie and Haley, why don't you go ahead and join us again and um did you any of you have any last comments before we end the presentation yeah, I just wanted to say thank you again for joining us. Thanks to both of our speakers and thanks to the NOAA Central Library for help, helping us make this series possible. Be sure to tune in every month to hear from more fellows and our next webinar is on July 15th. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. I'd like to conclude by thanking our speakers for sharing their research and Thank you, Haley, for the introduction. So best of luck to all three of you with your Knotts Fellowships. And audience, I truly appreciate that you joined us today for this library seminar. NOAA Central Library is very proud to present the work of the NOAA community and to support the Knotts Fellows. And we look forward to you joining us again. So be well all. Take care. <laughs>